And also, as we return back with our live broadcast here from the Delta Hotel in Helena, Montana, I'm going to introduce our keynote speaker, who is a familiar name and face to Montana Stock Growers members and ranchers across the nation. Mr. Don Close is an animal protein analyst at Rabo Agri Finance in the Rabo Research Food and Agribusiness Group. Close is responsible for analyzing all animal protein sectors and specializes in beef. Prior to joining Rabo AgriFinance, Close served as market director for the Texas Cattle Feeders Association in Amarillo, Texas, and many other industry leading organizations. Close has conducted research on a wide range of topics, including confinement cow calf operations, LFTP, ground beef and development in international trade. And he's also a regular speaker for state, national, and international livestock groups across North America, Australia, and New Zealand. Currently, Close authors bi monthly columns for the National Cattlemen's Publication and is working on market issues at the intersection of marketing and agri policy. And also, throughout this, uh, presentation by Don. If you have some questions, make sure and type that into the question bar on our plat digital platform here today. And at the conclusion of Don's comments, we will ask those comments on your behalf, those questions on your behalf, and, uh, and hopefully Don will have some great answers for us here today. Close is a graduate of West Texas A&M and has a bachelor's degree in ag economics. We will now turn it over via Zoom to our friend Don Close. Hi, Don, you're alive. Can you hear me on? Yes, yes, you are. All right. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Uh, I'm pleased to be with you this afternoon. I, uh, I wish we were all there in person. I was really looking forward to some of those short ribs at uh, lunch at the Northern Hotel today. So uh, I'm going to take an IOU on those and, uh, and we'll get started. The, uh, the presentation that I'm going to give today uh, started when, uh, when we were at uh, NCBA summer meeting in July, a project that I was working on. Uh, Fred and, and the, the Montana delegation got word of what I was working on and asked me if, if I would present some of this material. Uh, and so I'm happy to talk with you this afternoon. So what, uh, what I have been working on is... Um, with all of the debate and uh, the discussions going on on the uh, the whole price discovery piece and and the the accusations that have gone on of unfair pricing practices or disadvantaged uh, price pricing practices, I thought you know we really need to go into more detail with that whole data set, and so for. With the, with the benefit of being uh, stuck at home for and not out in the field as I typically am, uh, I've spent the last several months working on this material and uh, that I'm gonna share with you th this afternoon. So, <clears throat> I, I would sit at home at night and I would, I would watch different videos, uh, and you're all familiar with the ones I'm talking about, that uh, were making all kinds of false claims and just uh, spreading misinformation about the, the industry. And I said, you know, if I don't do anything else, I would like to present material, the, the facts of what we're dealing with with the whole pricing structure. And and what I've gone into is is the full history of the, of the weekly uh, cattle sales by transaction type. And when I first pulled all this uh, data down or started pulling it down, I was actually looking for a way to get a, a, a better estimate on weekly live finished cattle live weights. Uh, but as I got into it, I, could, I quickly saw that there was a whole lot more uh, information there. So what I have done is I've, con I've taken all of the transaction types. 
So all your live FOB uh, dressed, uh, the formula sales, the grid sales, and on the dressed components or, or versions of those sales, I have combined the live and carcass weights to get a yield estimate to transfer those carcass prices into a live equivalent. And I, the reason that I did that is it enables us to look at all transaction types and look and compare prices on an apples to apples basis. Once I had that completed, I, I did a ratio of the weighted average price of all transactions to cut out and drop. And uh, the reason that I converted all these prices to a live equivalent is my first thought was that, okay, that is, that's the, you know, weight times price equal dollars is the, the simplest transaction form that about everybody's going to, to understand. The real benefit of, of converting it all to a live price equivalent, though, is if we were to use this material uh, for pricing in the future, it would not require a complete rewrite or overhaul of the CME live cattle contract. It would still, prices would still be reported and recorded on a live, live or live equivalent basis. So when I looked at this deal, the, and, and the, the pressure or the criticism that the formula sellers and the negotiated grid sellers were under that they were taking advantage of the system or taking unfair advantage. And then with all of the talk we've had with 5014, with 3014, or any kind of negotiated uh, percentage or share numeric count of, of cash sales weekly, I've just had a lot of concern that cash transactions by design breed mediocrity, that we're buying cattle on the average, we're selling cattle on the average, uh, and, and it would ultimately mean deterioration in the quality grades that we've seen in recent years. That erosion in quality grade would, would lead to reduced customer satisfaction that would ultimately lead to reduced beef demand. And I look at all of the individual carcass merit transactions by design, those transactions continuously improve quality. That that bar or that plant average on the day of harvest, uh, that bar is continuously rising. So, you know, and then, then I looked at, okay, so all of the individual carcass merit transactions, they work for both buyer and seller. And, and that really explains why those transaction types have gained so much popularity uh, in such a short period of time. <clears throat> the primary takeaways that I'd like to have from today's conversation is leverage is the driver in this market. And, and the next slide I'm going to show uh, ex will show clearly show exactly that. Again, I've, I'm looking at all a comparison of all transaction types on an apples to apples basis will show that data. Uh, the ability to look at the ratio of all sales uh, weighted together uh, to cut out and drop and what does that uh, ratio look like. And then I'm going to spend, conclude the presentation today with a, a really quick look at transaction types by states and some um, pluses and minuses that, I, that I've discovered in looking at, at that information. So this is a leverage index, and, and it's the ratio of all cattle sales to comprehensive cutout plus drop. And if you'll think about this with me, if you, virtually everybody's familiar with the barometer, uh, the currentness index, or current currentness barometer that's on the front page of the cattle fax letter each week. This is essentially the very same calculation. But what it shows here, if you will look uh, at the beginning of, of 2014 uh, through today, we've added 6 million cattle to U.S. inventory. Half of that being cows and half of that being the offspring of those cows. At the very same time, we've done virtually nothing 
to, to improve or increase slaughter capacity. And there's been a few, you know, few isolated cases where some plant, plants have been reworked, but, but essentially nothing's changed. So you can see with that uh, back in 2014 and 15 when we were working with incredibly short cattle supplies, uh, that index was consistently trading up on top of 100. And then we worked through today with the added numbers into the system, uh, and you can see that we're, we've been in that uh, 90 to 95 slot. We've also seen that since the absolute fallout in the market in uh, in May and June uh, from the, the the severe COVID shutdown, the market's actually made some pretty uh, solid steps in, in recovery. But the one of the key takeaways that I want to make today is with with all of this debate going on on which transaction type is actually fair, how much cash trade is needed, the real shortfall of cattle prices today is due to the lack of leverage to the cattle feeder. And once cattle, once we, we've seen two years of cattle liquidation, all indications are we'll see a third. And at that point, we will shorten up supplies dressed the same way. I've taken the dressed uh, FOB and, and plant delivered um, and put them in. And the reason that I did that for those two categories is I thought the price variation between those two groups really doesn't do anything but reflect the freight difference from the point of origin to the plant. So if I, I wait them out, I'll have less less interference in the chart and, and I won't have uh, false price discrepancy becoming between uh, FOB and deliver. You'll also look in this chart with the, the blue lines and you will, uh, that is uh, negotiated grid live and you'll see a lot of skews in that that looks like false prices. For this conversation, blot that out. Uh, the reason that that those spikes are in that uh, negotiated grid is because there are just simply not enough consistent sales under that transaction type uh, to avoid having gaps in the data. But the real message here, look at from the negotiated FOB, negotiated dressed, uh, the formula live sales, the formula dress sales, and both the uh, grid live and, and, and dress grids, all of this debate and all of this discrepancy over that the, the formula sellers are capturing huge price advantages over the cash sellers simply is not true. Um, the, the last point that I would make from this slide is if you look at that what's kind of a orange burnt orange line here in this chart that a, a lion's share of those corn belt sales are, are dressed delivered sales that more often than not those cattle are, are actually bringing a higher price week by week than any other transaction type so in one sense here I think the, the group of producers who have been the most upset with how we're pricing cattle today are the ones that more often than not are getting uh, the best price. So this is the, uh, the ratio of the, the weighted steer and heifer price of all transaction types to cut out and drop. And again, the same thing showing up here that I showed you with that uh, uh, index. The average of this over the, the 2014 through today is 53.4. And you can see there with the where that ratio has been on an annual basis from 2014 through today. And, and I'll, I'll share with you, when I first started on this project, I really thought, okay, let's find the long-term running average. Let's take uh, cutout values plus drop times that fixed multiplier and we'd have a cash price. And the more I worked on this data, the more I've realized that's not going to happen. What that change in that ratio has, has or this multiplier is over time, reflects the currentness or the leverage in the marketplace and it's going to change over time. 
I think that looking at, I think this is a very good tool to use regardless of, of what transaction type we're using of what a live steer should be worth based on cut out and drop. But I also think that we have to be realistic and think that there's going to be a degree of float uh, in that number compared to the balance of cattle inventory to the balance of slaughter capacity. All right, so the the colored lines all bunched together there is the very same set of data that uh, I showed you with all of the various transaction types. And the red line that uh, is overlaid here is the cash price that would be derived from cut, from cutout plus drop. And I think there's some really, really interesting things to come out of this. First off, if you look at this in the, in the 2014 uh, and first half of 2015, and, and you look at the pointer over here, if we were pricing cattle off of cutout in, in that time window, cattle feeders would actually have received less money than what they got. And think back at the, during that period of time. Packers were paying you know, way above the market to gain access. They were faced with, with paying guaranteed hours every week. They were looking at buy cattle at the price uh, for capacity utilization or, or close altogether. And, and as a result of that, they were paying way more than, than what cutout would, would warrant. But you look at from the second half of 2015 all the way through to the first part of uh, the first half of 2019, that price relationship is spot on. Um, we get out here to to August of of last year. This represent this is the time period when when the uh, during the Holcomb fire and the uh, the complications that went on essentially for the remainder of 2019 on on getting those cattle harvested. We got the the ratio pretty well back in balance in January and February, and then uh, had the COVID shutdowns and the whole world went on tip. All right. If you look during these periods of, of post the fire and through the COVID experience, I'm not in any way implying and suggesting that that I think fed cattle would have shot up and and when when cut out made the the 475 or you know the where I'm trying to think where it got to uh, during the shortfall of supplies this spring. I'm not, I'm not in any way implying that packers are going to give all of that away. But I do think that in this period after the fire and even through the COVID experience, it would enable packers to save money when their margins are upside down or incredibly tight, but it would also enable them the opportunity to pay more money for cattle during periods of time when their margins are incredibly good and they have some additional dollars that they could share. So as you, you, I've been asked the question with this a lot of times, Don, why would the Packers in any way go for this kind of type of a program? And my first answer is because with the long range average, it's exactly the same price. And, and the second uh, answer I would give them, it fits what they're paying for cattle to closer in line with where their margins are. All right, so this is essentially the same data. The only thing that I have done here is instead of showing each of those transaction types independently overlaid with the uh, comprehensive cutout and drop, um, I put all the, the live cattle prices into one, steers and heifers, into one weighted average price. And it, it essentially shows the, the same thing. Now, what I'll share with you with this is if I, if I stop this at, and I look at the long-term average price of the live equivalent transactions at 126.28 and the cutout plus drop derivative at uh, 127.06, that long-term average uh, 
you know, within 75 cents of each other. I can tell you if I if I drop 2020 data out of there, I can get that long-term average within 50 cents of 100 of each other. The, re the efficiency of the marketplace is so great that it forces those two price series to, to run incredibly close together unless there's some major disruption in the market. So I don't want to spend too much time with these regression charts, you know, and have force you guys to look at them until your your eyes cross. The, what I want to do is show the R square of these transaction types, and this is from January of 2014 when AMS started making this data available, up until the week before the the fire on August 9th, and the R square. Of those two, the the weighted cash price on the x-axis and cutout values and drop on the y-axis, and that R square is a 0.89. Now, you know, for those of you that aren't bogged down with uh, looking at regression models on a daily basis, one is a perfect relationship, and zero is no relationship at all. So when we get at 88.9. We're close enough to one that I'm going to argue that we could price fed cattle off the cutout value with an incredibly high rate of reliability. So again, from 2014 to in front of the fire at 88.9. The next slide is the beginning of the data set in 2014 through uh, the year of 2019. So this incorporates that period of time uh, following the Holcomb fire. And that disruption in the market only reduced that R square down to an 83.2. Not as good, but certainly in an R square level that we could very reliably uh, price fed cattle. And, and I would, would argue with this is Yes, the, the Holcomb fire did cause disruptions in the marketplace, but in relationship to what the industry has seen with COVID, ends up it was just a small bump in the road. So now, this is, and I promise this is the last regression I'm going to show today, but this is 2014 to current. And, and with all of that distortion that we had in the market uh, in, in May and June, um, it pulled that R squared down to a 0.25. If you'll think back with me, uh, during the height of the COVID pressure, um, John Tyson uh, put an ad in the several of the, of the major U.S. papers and talking about how the industry was on the verge of a breakdown, and he caught a lot of criticism for that. And you'll think the he 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 even got called on the carpet by the president and said, "Look, don't be talking about the market breaking down. It's all going to be okay." If you look at this uh, for what it is, I'm not sure John Tyson was as was as wrong in, in his uh, assessment of the market at the time as as what he was uh, given credit for. So, to to try to tie this together, I'm going to repeat what I've said and think. Under normal market conditions, even with moderate degrees of disruption, I think we can price live cattle off the of cutout. I also am going to tell you that this 2020 deal has been so skewed that with, with from an analyst perspective, we should just throw that data set out, set it aside, uh, and look to, look to the market under more normal times. All right, so the, this slide, I know it's uh, <clears throat> kind of an awkward color combination there, but I, I did that intentionally. When we started out this thing and I was showing you a similar slide that showed the variation in prices by transaction type, this is the weighted average prices by state. And I put those bright colors in there so you can see it, and you can just barely see uh, the the tips of it, but you can see it places where the the Texas price series comes through uh, and the influence from the, the formula trade. 
the purple line there is for the K-State fans and the, the Kansas Price Series. The, the gold series is Iowa. And the, the green series is Nebraska. Now, I would tell you that Nebraska is actually much more competitively priced than what this slide depicts. But I'm still in the, the development stage of this work, and I'm having more problems matching up the carcass weights from one transaction type to the live weights from the FOB transactions, and that's where this skew is coming from. The price series by itself is, is actually very much in line with the other three states. So again, we've, we've now we've looked at this by the consistency of price by transaction type. We've looked at it by consistency of price by state level, and I'm going to argue till I'm blue that all of the energy that has been extended through the from the industry over the last two years over how much cash trade is required for price discovery has been a very poor choice of time and if you look at all of these transaction types uh, together there's really no reason for the fight we should be using our our energy on other enemies all right i'm about to wrap this up so the the last thing that i've done here is i have looked at the transaction types by state and in texas and and when i say texas i'm really talking about texas oklahoma new mexico but they have a total of six transaction types they sell cattle live fob I got the asterisk out there that they do sell a few cattle on a delivered basis, but it's very erratic, but I've, they're in, I've got them incorporated here. They sell cattle on a live formula that, again, is, is not a lot of volume, delivered formula that is, is the, a big volume, and then negotiated grid, both live and dressed. Kansas has seven transaction types, live and delivered, FOB and delivered, dressed, delivered, formulas, live and dressed and negotiated grids. Nebraska has eight transaction types. <clears throat> the live FOB delivered, dressed FOB delivered, formula live and dressed, grid live and dressed. Iowa only has four frequently used transaction types. Here's my conclusion from all of this. As you, as you all think with me, you know, transaction types really develop over time and just by happenstance. <clears throat> if you look at the number of transaction types in Texas and Kansas at six and seven against the total number of cattle they sell on a weekly basis, I really think the balance is pretty, pretty right. And I don't think it was in by any grand design. I think it just worked out. I would argue that Nebraska is suffering from too many various transaction types. And what I'm to try to say that in a in a simpler way, of all the cattle sold, they're dividing those cattle into eight different buckets. And when you dis, when you distribute that total number of sales eight different ways, you work down to such a small number by transaction type that it starts to distort and cause friction in the market. I'd also argue that Iowa has too few. That, you know, should should there have been some formula trade, should their negotiated grids be available or reported in Iowa, I absolutely believe they should. So here's my quick takeaway from this. Instead of implementing 5014, 3014, or any kind of uh, negotiated transaction number, instead of trying to pull the other sales locations down to match where I was at, the effort should be spent to add transaction types to Iowa to bring them up to the to be comp more competitive with the other location. One last thing I should have mentioned with all of these. Uh, they all have uh, 
contract forward contract pricing both live address all four states and and i left those forward contracts out of all of the study because it is a different transaction type it is under a different timeline and it is a, a totally different set of of inputs used to establish those prices <clears throat> all right so i'm going to wrap this up the benefits of going to a cutout derived uh, pricing platform simple we've talked about it all day cutout prices would better reflect cutout values um, it would provide all producers with a more transparent base to price count now I am I am in no way saying that whatever the implied base price is from cutout is the final final set I'm not saying that at all the producer and the packer would still have the ability to negotiate cattle quality they would have the opportunity by plant and by firm to negotiate over expected yield variations uh, from, on a carcass yield basis you would still have the influence in the market from the uh, regional supply uh, and differences would would all be a part of, of negotiations and the full price discovery process the other point is it would leave the premium as I said early on it would leave the futures market structurally as it is today now it would change the CME contract from a cash cattle basis to a cutout basis so basis will change I'm not suggesting but but the core contract would all would stay the same but base, basis histories would be uh, have to be adjusted. <clears throat> All right, it would it would buffer cattle cost in periods of incredibly tight cattle supplies. I, I showed that in that 2014 and 2015 time window, and it would support cattle prices during periods of extremely high cutout. It would be it, it's not going to curb packer margins whatsoever over the long run these prices virtually come out to the same price but it would align with the packer when he needs to save some money and he would pay more money when he has as uh, increased margins to do so and with that i will uh i i hope in covering this uh, in such a short window uh that i didn't I didn't lose everybody along the way, but I'd be more than happy to answer any questions. All right. Hey, thank you so much, Don. And we do have one question, and I'm sure a, a few more will uh, start compiling there on our chat, whether you're on your phone or on our uh, our desktops as well. But Lon Rukoff, uh, uh, Lon, uh, thank, thanks for sending a question in. And Lon, of course, is a producer from Eastern Montana, Don. And his question is, what is the possible effect of more small meat packing plants and farm to consumer direct sales in this conversation? Great question. I, I'm glad that came up. I, I think it's a double-edged sword. <clears throat> and, and I say that for this reason. I'm not opposed to small regional plants at all. But I think to add enough small local plants to really come up with total slaughter capacity that we need to balance slaughter availability to cattle supply is just going to be an incredibly difficult challenge. We go to some of the, the mobile uh, slaughter uh, facilities that, that you see. I. My concern is if, if we were to have an E. coli problem uh, or, or any other animal health problem from, from a small producer, it's going to paint the, 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 everybody in the industry is going to be painted with the same broad brush. So that's my lookout. But as far as, as supporting the local community, having a, a, a supply of know where your food comes from for that audience, I think I'm, I'm fine with it. All right, thank you so much, Don. Now uh, our friend Ty Jones, uh, he, his question is, what caused the price spike in May of 2017, referring to uh, your charts in the presentation? 
Hmm. Uh, I'm gonna give you. A, I'm gonna give you an. I don't know, but I can find out. Um, I'm absolutely drawing a blank on what would have caused that that price spike at that time. Um, I, I've got to look it up. I'm sorry. Okay. But I, you know, I had my contact info up there. Um, I, I'd be happy to get an answer. I just don't have it today. All right. Thanks, Don. Uh, next. Okay. Hey, thanks, Don. Uh, our, our next question is from Rusty Ellis. Th Rusty, thanks for uh, chiming in here. His question is, how do you forward price? How do forward pricing deals affect price? How do forward pricing deals affect price? Um, Fortunately, I don't think we have enough of them on a regular basis to really, uh, I don't think there's the, the distortion in there that that's concerned. Um, I would also say that uh, I would would argue that, and, and I, had a, I had a lengthy conversation with uh, USDA uh, AMS guys on the forward pricing of, of meat and, and the distortion that that would cause in the market. And specifically, my, my question was, is that product priced when the contract is made or is that contract priced when it's delivered? And, and the conclusion of that conversation is, I don't think it's going to be distortive to the market because if you think about the, diff the, the USDA definitions of a cash sale and a formula site that they cannot record the price or the transaction until they know the price. And if that's a combination of a, a cash base plus uh, a premium and discount schedule. It's the same thing with on the box side. They cannot report the transaction until they have a completed price. So as a result of that, the overwhelming majority of those transactions are completed within the 21-day window of when that price is reported. So it's, it, when it's reported becomes very much in the timeline of a, a spot, ca spot cash cutout transaction. So my, I, hope I'm, I hope I'm answering the, the right question here, but my takeaway answer on this one is I do not think the, the, the forward pricing is going to cause the disruption in the market that is feared. All right, uh, Don, our next question is from Shane Eaton. And uh, Shane's question is, is formula price cattle in the early graphs you had showing the price differences between grid negotiated and cash? Uh, he had a hard time trying to figure out where formulas were in those graphs. And what effect does formula cattle captive supply have on your data when looking at prices over the past five years? Okay, great question. The formula price the uh, grid prices are both net prices. So they're on a per hundred weight basis and they're compared with the uh, the FOB prices. So so it's a it's a net. It's after the premium and discount schedule is is locked in. So those prices they run that close together. And and I'll go a step further. You say, okay, so if the formula price is that close to the FOB price, what's the attraction? And I'll say this, i say the first is the real benefit to the, those marketing agreements is it enables those cattle feeders to pinpoint or know within a two week window of when the cattle will ship. So they gain an advantage that they don't have cattle on the show list for a week, two weeks, and then carry a week before they ship. That's the real advantage. They they know they have rail space available. Um, the other the other thing, and I've talked extensively with the uh, the hog guys on this one. There's been just some conversation of, do we need to get a contract library for all of the agreement trades that are out there? And for that, my my answer to that one is, I wholeheartedly agree with it. But as I have talked with the the pork producers that have that 
uh, contract library now, they say, look, there are contracts out there that are incredibly attractive. There are contracts out there that don't look attractive at all. But the average of all of them, those cash prices fall, those net prices fall very much in line with cash. I'm going to go one, take this one step further. I think most all of us could reference cases where a guy sells a set of cattle on a formula and the cattle will return, let's just say, a four, six dollar, a hundred premium over the cash average for that week. And and all of us are human. When when we have a set of cattle that beat that grid, we can't get to the coffee shop fast enough to tell everybody about how good our cattle are. But at the very same time, the number of cattle that are on a formula or a grid that do not meet the plant average and they could even be looking at a discount they're not too quick to race to town to share that one so i think that's that's part of what's going on there is is we have built this perception that those cattle all bring big premiums and in reality it's not there All right, thanks, Shane, for that question. And our final question here today, uh, Don, is what's the impact of beef exports to China on domestic live prices? That uh, question comes from Kevin Coburn. Wow. Um, <clears throat> so far, not much. <laughs> it's a lot of fun, and it's a lot of potential. Uh, but if you look at the, t and, and it, I mean, tremendous potential. But, but if you look at the volume of sales on either a weekly or a monthly basis to date, the volume that we're selling to Japan, the volume that we're selling to South Korea, Mexico, so far overweighs the volume that we're sending to China that uh, it's, it's not really a price mover as of yet. But that is not to say that it most certainly has the potential to get there in time. You know, and the, and the, the way that I like to explain that one is for the economic, the number of economic elite in China is greater than 300 million people. Their, their, ultra, their status of ultra rich equals the population of the United States. So as we establish that market and find ways to connect with those customers to buy quality of U.S. product, it most certainly can grow over time if we can stay out of a spat with them, um, but it's not there today. Hi, Don. This is Kenny with MSGA. Um, we'd just like to once again thank you for sharing this presentation with us. Um, and we can't wait to see you in person next time, okay? I will be there. Okay. Thank you very much. Bye. All right, a big thank you to Rob Oegger Finances, Don Close, and uh, we hope to see you next year back here in Montana for this in-person event uh, that we will be having hopefully next year once uh, the COVID is, uh, is all taken care of here. But uh, again, thank you to Don Close for sh sharing those comments here today.